go ahead and get started since we do have a lot of content in this presentation. So I, I don't want us to miss out on anything or be scrambling for time at the end if you guys have questions. Um, so my name is Victoria Bleckel and I graduated from Theta Upsilon at Case Western Reserve University in 2019. I'm currently serving as the section, section H4 leadership chair and a community advisor at uh, Alpha Delta. So um, just got into the APO volunteer world, having a blast, looking forward to doing more as an advisor once my own graduation happens. I'm currently in graduate school. So that's kind of putting a damper on how much I can get to APO, but I can still do fun stuff like this. So that's kind of cool. Um, can I just have everyone say what grade, not grade, wow, what year you guys are in, or if you're an alum? We'll start with, yeah, Jack, go ahead, why don't you, since you're muted already. Oh, um, I'm a senior. Okay, cool. So I'm graduating. All right. I'm also a senior. Okay, cool. Um, I actually graduated last May, so I'm an alum. Cool. Hey, so this is this is very timely. We don't have any freshmen. That's that's good. <laughs> All right. He doesn't like that. And then yeah, there we go. All right. Today's plan. Um, we're gonna go over three things. First one is uh, you graduated. What do you want to do? What are you doing with your life? You have so many options after you do undo your undergrad, and it can be very overwhelming. So we're going to look at a, a tool that can help you try to find that path. Then we're going to move into crafting resume because probably you're going to need a resume at some point, assuming you need to, you know, make money and eat and live somewhere. Uh, you're going to need that resume. And then number three, making a LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is a great way to network. It's a really great way to find jobs, to make professional connections. So, you know, our generation, we should really have this and have it be modern, updated, comprehensive, all that good stuff. So to start us off, right, that doesn't work. Um, how do you feel about your post-graduation plans where you are right now? How are you feeling? I feel okay. I have somewhat of a plan. I'm gonna to go to um, physician's assistant school after I take a gap year, but the problem is filling that gap year, I guess. Same. <laughs> Highly recommend a gap year. I did a gap year. Um, I would be on a very different path if I hadn't done that gap year and it probably would not have been the best path for me. So <clears throat> yeah, gap years are fine. They're, when you go to grad school, it, it's all different ages. So literally nobody cares. <laughs> Any other comments on that question? I have a question. So you said that you had a completely different path. What did you like, what changed during your gap year then, I guess? Yeah, so I, the original plan was I was gonna try to get a uh, master's of the arts in directing, but I wanted to take a year and get some work experience first. And then I didn't get any of the apprenticeships I applied to. I couldn't find any work anywhere. So, I ended up actually working at a daycare after the summer and did a lot of um, like career search, like, like, uh, like pathfinding kind of stuff like that. We're going to get into that process next. Um, and then I kind of realized, you know, I really like to be home. I live in Cincinnati. I grew up in Cincinnati. I like to be in Cincinnati. I like to be home. I like to have lots of animals in my house and you know, I want to have kids and have a settled family. And that is not compatible with a directing lifestyle. <laughs> it's just not. And so for me, that year was a good time to evaluate, okay, I think my personal needs are going to outweigh the professional fulfillment that I would get from that. Yeah. And I've been able to find something else that I'm interested gotcha. in. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, so for our first part, we're gonna be using this book it's called Designing Your Life 
And these two guys actually, they actually teach a course of um, Harvard. That's yeah. They actually teach this book as a course at Harvard. Um, and it is a really great book. Um, if you really like, if you like to journal at all, this is a really good, you probably like it. It's very good for that. Um, but I'm gonna give you kind of just like intro basic stuff that they go over in terms of, I have this degree, what do I do with it? What do I do? So to start, we're gonna, they have their toolkit here. here we go. So the design plan for when you first graduate and you're looking for jobs, looking for internships, apprenticeships, um, other programs, school, whatever you're looking for, you need to do these four things. Number one, be curious. Be willing to take classes that you've never heard of before. Be willing to attend webinars about things that sound interesting, but you don't really know anything about. You know, look out in your community and see, oh, what free opportunities can I find where I can go and experience something new? I right? have your mind be open to things like that because through undergrad, you've gained a set of skills, right? And you've gained proficiency and um, and you, you've liked something, right? You found a skill you like. So that's what finding a direction and finding a job is, is finding what you like and then figuring out how you can do that. So if you already know what you like, or if you at least know what you're good at, then you can use that to look for opportunities, which then you then try it, try stuff. Um, read books that, about things that you don't know about. Um, take that summer job. And even if it's in a department, uh, not department, it's even if it's in a field that thinking, I don't know if this is the field I want to be in the rest of my life, that's okay. Um, I think the average is people do uh, 10 job changes before they find the job that they will eventually retire from. So there is no shame, especially today in having a summer job, having a job for a year, that's fine. Try it. If you're able to work there, if they compensate you enough, if it is fulfilling, it works. All right, number three, reframe problems. So this is a big one, especially if you're like me and you graduated and you're freaking out like, oh my gosh, I have, I, my brain, I was like, I have this useless degree. I had political science and theater, which you, you could, you could argue that it was useless. However, for my plan, it's not, but you know, I'm, I have had that, oh my gosh moment. Why did I even go to undergrad? Like I didn't, I have no job prospects here. What am I going to do? Um, but reframing the problem helped me look at the degrees that I had gotten and say, okay, but political science, look at all of these writing skills that I acquired that some of my peers hadn't. That gives, that makes me unique in that way. And oh, theater, oh, I've collaborated with all these teams and that's something that I bring to the table, right? So if you're stuck on a problem, try to reframe it in a way where you're highlighting your own skills and your own passion because it's there. And then last, know it's a process. You're probably not going to find your dream job right out of college. That happens for some people. Good for them. I hope it happens for you. There probably won't. Again, 10 career changes before you, you will probably find the one that you will retire from. So that's a lot. And that's okay. Any questions at this point? Cool. All right. The second thing I would highly recommend taking from this book is an Odyssey plan. Um, I really appreciate the name too. Kind of fits with the APO theme. Um, I like it a lot. And here is the definition. So it is actually, it's a visual timeline. So you are going to be drawing right, a timeline. And then these little dashboards, just like you have on your car, you know, a little arrow. 
and it helps you gauge the reality of a plan. In this case, it's a five-year plan. So here is the blank template. So if you, I know it's a little fuzzy on the bottom. The gauges at the bottom say resources. Oh, resources, I like it, confidence and coherence. And each column would be a year. So the first column, you know, where do I think I wanna be in a year? And it doesn't have to be accurate. It doesn't have to be right. It's just where you think you're gonna be in a year, that's it. Um, you're encouraged to put professional and non-professional goals on here. Um, if you have like a vacation plan that you know you're doing in two years, put it on there, that's important. That's part of life. Um, and then the dashboard at the bottom, you evaluate when you're completely finished writing, then you can evaluate, okay, well, how likely is this gonna happen? You know, Do I have the resources to do this, right? If my year one is like, oh, I'm gonna go invent a new gadget and it's gonna make me millions of dollars. Okay, I don't have the resources to do that, right? <laughs> I just don't. I don't have the resources. I don't have the education or the background. I don't have the support. That, that's not going to happen. Uh, maybe I really, really like it. And it's all the way on the one end. Or I like it, but that's not going to help me if I have no resources to do this plan. So they actually recommend doing multiple um, to kind of gauge where you... It helps you gauge which one might be a bit more appealing to you. So I'm going to show you the one that I did um, when I was first using this book. It was in 2019. I had just finished my summer job after college and I couldn't find a full-time job. I was um, unemployed. I, I was so upset. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to find a job. Like, what am I going to do? And this kind of helped me reorient myself. So. All right, it's gonna be messy, it's supposed to be messy. All right, this is the one I made. Uh, a lot of this did not happen, I will say. So it does not have to be accurate. This was the nonprofit employee plan. And I did make three of these. Um, and one of which was, uh, you know, directing. I made a directing path. So the nonprofit employee, see, I thought I was gonna be a master's of business administration or an MA. Well, it turns out I did research. I'm actually master's of public administration is what I ended up going into. Um, I did work at Cincinnati Museum Center over the summer. We're over here, if you can, right here. Um, these uh, internships though, they did not happen. Um, time constraints are real after you graduate and I just could not work full-time and also do an internship. I couldn't even think about applying for that. So, but that's okay. All right, I did get engaged. Um, did not become leads trained, unfortunately, because they didn't offer it that year, sad times. But I did get my um, presentation training. So that was fun. Yeah, I was like, right, I've got um, nationals for year two. Uh, that also didn't happen, but that was COVID related. <laughs> so yeah, right. It's not, it's not gonna, it's not what actually is going to happen. Um, I'm not working at a nonprofit right now. I'm trying to get a job at a nonprofit, but I'm not there yet. Uh, we are going to Disney this year. So that's happening. Um, I did get married in 2020. Uh, we actually already have a house and a dog. So, right, like this doesn't have to be an accurate representation. It shouldn't be an accurate representation unless you're a seer and you know exactly what you're going to be doing. And honestly, if you, this is an accurate representation, then you probably don't need to be doing this exercise if you already know exactly what you're going to be doing in five years. Um, yeah. But the, what's also important is the concerns at the bottom. Make sure you do those. Um, so for, for this one, so will I be able to find an organization that I love? That was really important to me, the mission of the organization. Um, and it still is a concern, right? And so because I did this exercise, I know that the mission of an organization is very, very important to me, which is part of the reason why I decided to get 
and master's public administration because all those organizations are going to be you know public service mission driven um will the day-to-day -day responsibilities be satisfying um, that kind of prompted me to look more into what different positions do i'm pretty sure i never want to go into fundraising i don't think i would enjoy that um and last one is personal our kids and option by year three right so that's something that i have to think of, you know I was going to have to think about too. You know, we both need to have full time stable jobs. So, those were the concerns I had in 2019 about this plan. Um, looking back on it is very weird though, because it's now 2021 and I made this in 2019. Um, so, yeah. How do you guys feel about the Odyssey plans? Do you think that might be something interesting that you could do? It's like an exercise. I like it. I think it's a good way to kind of get your thoughts on paper and kind of have something to report back to and hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be the best thing for holding yourself accountable. Um, Cause it's not, it, it's going to be things that aren't set in stone. Right. So, you know, when I look at this, I don't need to feel bad that, Oh, I didn't ever enter at a, nonprofit organization because I can look at myself and say well Victoria you work 50 hours a week and you have class like that was a that's something that was just not going to happen so that makes sense yeah right so or two crafting a resume Great. what do you guys think uh, your resume should tell a potential employer Um, it should probably tell them how you are different from other um, applicants to a job. Okay. And probably um, lay out how suited you think you are for the job by talking about like your experiences and skills and education. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, those are both going to be really important. Um, the special skills section is a really great place to highlight what makes you better suited for the position, what makes you unique. Uh, and then uh, I'm glad you mentioned that you're showing like a specific job, why you're good for that job, because that's going to come up when we talk about little tricks, tricks and tips later of how you should be changing your resume every time you apply for something, which most people don't know. Okay. So the way that you should tell these potential employers why you are so amazing and why you are the best person for the job, why you would be just perfect. You're just you're a perfect applicant is accomplishment statements. You guys heard of accomplishment statements before? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, no. Um, I think there are a couple people in the waiting room. I just got a text. I can't see it. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can get. Ah, I found it. Okay. Yes, you're right. There were two people waiting. Thank you. Okay, there it goes. All right. I'm sorry you guys were waiting. That is my one Zoom thing that I can never fully comprehend is how to tell when people are in the waiting room. I'm very sorry. Um, I'm glad you were here. And we are talking right now about resumes. And let me get this. Okay. All right, when all that should begin. Um, hi, so I'm Victoria Bleckle. We are currently talking about resumes. So you came in at a good time. We just started the second section. Um, 
So let's get back to that section. Okay. Um, so you're just about to start talking about accomplishment statements. Um, the Zuku already in here said that they had not heard of them before. Has anyone who just joined heard of them before? Okay, that's okay, we're gonna talk about them. All right, so I like this graphic, so we're, gonna, we're using this one. Um, basically, it's a story of how you did something fabulous at a past position. So like all great stories, you need to have a little bit of context and then two more, import, more important aspects are what you did and how that created a positive result. And you really need to have the result part. That's what normally gets left out, right? If you worked as a, um, sometimes I said like, uh, I worked as a dietary aide at a nursing home and I'm off the floors every day, right? Like, you know, I could say, oh, you know, maintain, maintain, ew, maintained clean environment promoting the safety and health of the employees and residents, right? There's a, what I did and how it positively affected the organization when all I really did was I mopped the floor. But without that, I'm saying, oh, I'm off the floor. And they're like, great, anybody can mop the floor. <laughs> all right, that's not special. Um, so we're gonna look at another example here. I like you to try to guess what you think I did. I will tell you, this was at my, when I was an assistant teacher at a daycare. So created organizational system for record keeping and seating charts, creating a safer environment. Guess at what that actual, actual action that I did. <laughs> All right, so I made a chart <laughs> so that we could write down the dates that we gave the toys bleach baths and made a seating chart for the lunch kids. <laughs> it's literally all I did, right? That's a very simple task. But in this accomplishment statement, I'm creating a safe environment for children. I understand that that's an important aspect of caring for children which means that I understand the needs of our clients and our stakeholders. I am creating an organizational system, so I'm organized. Um, I made something new, so I am taking initiative, I'm creative. All of those things are packaged up in that accomplishment statement. And they wouldn't have been if I had just said, you know, I made a chart for documenting, you know, uh, weekly cleanings that wouldn't have been captured as well as an accomplishment statement like this. Any other questions or comments on accomplishment statements? Yeah, I have a question. Hmm? Sorry, it's probably kind of loud. Um, so are these accomplishment statements, like what you write under, like, are these like the bullet points of, yes, is that what you're talking about? Yep. That was a, yep. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> exactly. This is what should be going on your resume under your position title where you're writing. Yeah. What you did. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, just some random other tips and tricks that I've kind of garnered from working at, uh, I work at a career consulting firm. So I've kind of just picked up some stuff there, picked up stuff from reading, um, you know, talking to professionals in the field, just kind of random things. So I put them all on a slide so that you guys could have them. All right. Do edit your resume for each job. Um, actually, a lot of times a person will not be looking at your resume. It will be a computer 
scanning your resume, looking for keywords. And if you don't have a certain percentage of those keywords, your resume doesn't even get looked at by a person. So look at the job description, look at the words they're using. So if it says, you know, uh, one of the requirements is be able to work collaboratively. Then if you've worked in a team before in that job, but you know, worked collaboratively with these other team members to accomplish this, you need to have these, those exact words. Cause a lot of times it will be a computer searching. And even if you're very qualified, if you don't have those terms, it's just not going to get sent to a person because there's too many people applying. Um, strong verbs. So, sorry, I lost my train of thought. You know, when you say, uh, see, I made a lesson plan. Made's not a very strong word. It's not a very strong verb, right? It's like, okay, you made it. What does that mean? But if I say, you know, I cultivated a lesson plan or I created, even, even create is better than made, right? Made's very vague. Try not to use vague verbs when you're describing what you did in your job. Um, if you're doing, you know, I answered calls. No, I represented the company with a friendly voice and face. Strong, real strong verbs. And then do use a professional email address. Um, I kid you not, I once came across an email address. It was like, um, sexy Jeff at Gmail. It was ridiculous. I was like, I was looking at his resume. I was like, this guy did not just put this email address on a resume. <laughs> I cannot believe this. Um, if you don't have a professional email address, just, just make one. You're just going to have to do it, you know? Make one that doesn't have sexy and it doesn't have, you know, hot girl, blah, 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 you know, Justin Bieber lover, nothing like that. Um, you, yeah. There's no excuse, but hopefully, I don't think um, people in their 20s and 30s, they don't really have that issue as much. All right. Um, do not put your address if you're applying for a non-local job. If I'm applying for a job in Cleveland, I'm not gonna put that I live in Cincinnati. They can find that out during the interview process, but if they see that, they're gonna think, why is she applying here? That she's not even local. So I don't know why she's applying. And so I'm just gonna toss it out because it's not worth the time and effort to figure out why. Whereas if it comes up in the interview process and it's, oh, I'm moving to Cleveland, but we're not you know, there yet. And then it's, oh, okay, so she's coming. But it's hard to put that on a resume. So just don't put your address if you're applying for a non-local job. Honestly, you probably don't even need it if you're applying for a local job. Um, and a lot of places you'll have to put it in electronically anyway. So. All right, um, if your GPA is under 3.6, don't put it on there. I actually read this um, in an article, um, just because there's probably gonna be candidates that have a GPA higher than that. So don't point out that your GPA was lower than that, right? They don't need to know that. But if it is over 3.6 and you wanna include it, go for it. Any other questions for the resume section? I know we have a, we've got a lot of content today, so I'm trying to make sure we get through it all. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to our third topic, creating a LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is a lot of fun um, and it has a lot of tools that people don't really utilize because it's hard to find those tools. Um, you can actually network with people just like you could on Facebook, like there's like the Facebook, Facebook groups, there's LinkedIn groups, and you can see posts from them just like you would any other group on social media. So I'm a part of Greater Cincinnati Nonprofit Professionals. So sometimes, you know, I'll see jobs post up and I'm like, oh, that one looks really interesting and I'll apply. And I wouldn't have found out about that job otherwise. So. It's a cool platform. I hope you all be able to use it. We're going to do four steps to creating comprehensive LinkedIn profile. Number one, the picture. Um, 
so I, I made a, a meme based on the Dolly Parton meme. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> like two years ago? I don't even remember when that was anymore. Uh, COVID's been like five years, so I don't know. But these are pictures that might be appropriate on these different types of social media. And I would like to open the floor and let you guys brainstorm why the LinkedIn, pic the LinkedIn picture is good for LinkedIn and why the other ones are not good for LinkedIn. Start. Do you want us to um, say, stay, say something or do you want us to like post it in the chat? How do you want to uh, yeah, you could that? Just make yourself and go. There's not that many of us, so we should be good. Yeah, I was going to say, I think your LinkedIn is like a, essentially a professional Facebook. Um, so I think that you should have, you shouldn't have other people in your photo. It should just be you and it should be a very clean professional look because this is like recruiters or potential um employers are going to be seeing this and they want to see you in your most what, what they're going to see in the workplace not what, what they're going to see at the bar on a friday night yes you'd be surprised how many people have pictures of them like out at an event and they've just cropped it and you're like dude we can see like the bar lights like we what why are you doing this and this is a problem that you know some of the other ones i've said you know oh our generation doesn't really have an issue with this this is one that pretty much everybody does all all age groups mess up the linkedin picture so i'm a little surprised but we all did that um yeah you mentioned having a second person a big no-no don't have a second person um me i linked and i'm obviously wearing much fresh more professional garb than like the t-shirt or the leather jacket. Any other thoughts about why, you know, the Instagram or the Tinder or the Facebook picture? I don't have a Tinder, I'm married, but. Why they're not good. I feel like this might just be super picky, but I feel like the lighting and the LinkedIn one is so much more professional looking and just, it's very clear to tell who you are and what you look like. That is nitpicky, but that's good we're supposed to be nitpicky um yeah the instagram one that's very distracting right that big flash um i think it's a spotlight yeah that's very distracting you don't want them to be looking at anything other than your face so that will go ahead and look at why each of these pictures is not okay for linkedin for the facebook one um as was said multiple people right i have a pretty traditionally feminine name so you could probably guess which person I am in that photo uh, but my husband's name is Rory so like if that was his picture which one is it and um, also this is related to a life event this was the night I got engaged uh, people will put wedding pictures as their LinkedIn profile uh, birthday parties you know getting engaged anything like that you don't really want to be on your LinkedIn profile um, just because it doesn't, it doesn't look as professional. All right, the Tinder one. First off, you got a dog in it. Um, really shouldn't be anybody else but you. Uh, even though Sammy is very cute, he doesn't need to be my LinkedIn profile. Um, and then the one other one is it's a very outdated picture of me. Um, that was probably about five years ago. I had very long hair. I wore contacts all the time you might not even recognize me if you know you saw me on linkedin and then we scheduled a face-to-face -face meeting you might be looking around the coffee shop going okay where is this victoria person because i don't see anybody look like her picture here All right instagram so that one also doesn't really look like me i was actually in a theater production in this picture um if you can see the mic on my face so this was in a musical. So this is not how I dress. That's not how I wear my makeup. That's not how I wear my hair. That is how that character wore all of that stuff. So I don't present myself like that. That's just not how I like to dress. That's not how I like to wear makeup, none of that. Um, again, there's that other person, even though I like kind of cropped her out, you can still tell she's there. 
right? Don't try to do that sneaky bit of like, oh, if I cut it, then you can just see like the tiniest bit of their sleeve. No, we can tell that you didn't take the time to take a professional picture. <laughs> so um, distracting background, like you mentioned that big spotlight, that's very distracting. Um, and then it highlights a hobby. People will put pictures of them skiing on the basketball court, you know, doing things like that. You know, it's great to have hobbies. Um, employers know you're gonna have hobbies, but why are you putting that in your LinkedIn profile? You don't really need that there. All right, and then the LinkedIn one is good because it focuses on me. It's just me, my face is centered. Um, sorry, my computer is trying to update, don't do that. I'm wearing professional clothing. The background is solid color. And then smiles. You want to be smiling in your picture. It makes sure this smile reaches your eyes. Don't be that person that's, mm, I'm smiling, but you know, I don't look happy at all. You want someone to feel good when they go to your LinkedIn page and say, oh, that's a person I want to meet. That's a person I want to have coffee, coffee with. That's a person that I want to talk to about their interests and their goals and figure out what they're all about. All right, step two, this is the headline. So again, very, very similar to Facebook. This is what shows up at the very top when someone would click on your profile. And there's a bunch of different aspects here. So we're gonna talk about each one. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the cover photo. Again, LinkedIn is a lot like Facebook functionally. So if you're comfortable with Facebook, you're probably gonna be comfortable using LinkedIn. Um, this is where people would put a lot of times like a banner with their company name on it, or, um, maybe like their position or their department. Um, if they're in school, they could put their school there. I chose to do something different because I am currently, I'm not in career transition, but I am in a temporary job. So I want to make sure that when people go to my profile that they know what I'm interested in and that is childhood literacy. So I decided books are a great way to represent that, you know, knowledge, education, literacy, that all gets conveyed if I have books. So that's why I chose that. Um, I know I helped my mom and she is really, really interested in helping people grow. So she chose um, a cover photo and her, her job doesn't let them use their logo at all on like any social media. So she couldn't do that. So she has like um, some kind of like little plant like diagram with people, it's very cute. Um, right, your headline cover photo should tell them something about you. Um, two. Uh, going back to that picture real fast, uh, make sure that your picture is centered on you and get your face to fill it as much as you can. Um, so that way when people are looking at it on their screens, they see your face. Okay. Um, this is the, I think it's called the title line. This is where people a lot of time will put their position. I chose not to because that's not what I really want people to know about me when they first got on my profile. I want them to see this brand of education and literacy. So I chose a quote. Um, but again, the, the, you have to ask yourself what brand you are creating and what you want people to know about you when they get on your profile. If that's, you know, student at University of Cincinnati, that's what you want. If that's, you know, electrical engineer at so-and-so company, that's what you want. Um, just kind of have to decide what is best for you. Right, it's 94 connections. Um, this is where it's unlike Facebook. Don't friend, or it's not really friending, don't accept requests from people that you haven't met. Um, you can reach out to people via messaging if you're not connected with them and set up that initial meeting. Um, I have done that before, I just reached out randomly. Like, hey, I see that you are involved with this company. I'm really interested in what this company is doing can we set up a Zoom meeting and chat? Then I, you know, asked for them to accept a request from me. But 
you don't really need to be accumulating a bunch of bunch of connections and it's not really going to help you. Um, you want to be connecting with people that you've met that you have networked with, you know, maybe you attended a session with them or you worked with them. Um, any of those things that that's who you want to be connecting with. Right over here to the right. Um, you actually get to highlight two organizations. Um, and if I had let it do the default, it actually would have put Promark and then University of Cincinnati because that's where I currently go to school. However, most of the people that I'm connecting with on here know me through my job at Promark or because they're also a graduate from Case Western. So I chose to flip it and have my undergraduate be up there so that when people go to my profile and they're thinking, okay, why do I know this person? Then they can go over there and say, oh, she went to Case Western, that's why I know her. Oh, she works at Promark and I went to a workshop at Promark and she was the, yeah, she was the nice administrative assistant who helped me find where the workshop room was. Um, all just little things that help people figure out who you are. All right, that's the headline section. Right. Very similar things with the about section, which is um, going to show up right below your head, your headline. Um, in the about section, honestly, it could just be taken from the about section on your resume. If you want those two to be the same, that totally would work. Um, but I want people to know that I am working towards nonprofit leadership and I have these interest areas. Um, I do have a bachelor's degree. So that's what I want people to know, right? I think you can kind of tell what brand I'm creating when I'm making my LinkedIn profile. Um, but if your brand is, I work for this company and I am committed to this company and you know this is the company I'm gonna retire from, that's fine too. Cause you're gonna make connections to that company. You're gonna make connections working with other companies and it is totally fine if they know you as, oh yeah, that's the guy that works at this company just kind of depends on what you need in your life right now. All right, we have any questions at this point before we go to the, the next one? I actually have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering, you had said like you shouldn't add people you don't know. So I have a LinkedIn and I get requests from like recruiters and stuff. And I always accept mm -hmm. them because like, I feel like a recruiter is someone who's like looking for someone to like connect with and get an opportunity for. Mm -hmm. um, you say that that's not in my best interest to just accept all those recruiters. So are you getting just a, just a blanket like not really, like connection request or are they messaging you? Just a connection request usually. And then sometimes they'll call me then if they, cause then they'll have access to my phone number once we're connected. Um, I'm also, so I'm in the, I'm in like a lab type industry and a lot mm -hmm. of the roles um, go through contracting agencies. So then you'll have recruiters calling you and asking like what you're looking for and they'll place you oh. at least like in the beginning. So, I mean, in my, I feel like in my experience, it's probably maybe a good thing, like, like not just anyone, but at least recruiters. Cause they'll say like recruiting for this company and you'll know that they're a recruiter. Okay. I had never experienced that. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, that if that's how that works and if you are getting opportunities for that then absolutely yeah do that um okay. yeah my only experience with recruiters on linkedin has been personal message and normally it has nothing to do with anything i actually i think that it's just like a bot that yeah some of them on your resume <laughs> some of them definitely are um but some of them some of them aren't um my other question so my cover photo at the moment mm -hmm. Is, it just says leadership friendship service and alpha phi omega on it um but i'm in the scientific industry but i don't have like i'm not in like a big role yet because it's all just been contracting stuff do you think that that's an appropriate cover photo or should i have something more geared towards scientific mm -hmm. stuff do you use your profile are you looking for opportunities are you looking to connect with alumni are you looking to connect with other professionals in your field what are you kind of trying to use kind of a little bit of all of that honestly um 
I'm always, I love connecting with people in AFIO. Like I I would love to be more involved, which is why I'm here. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an alumni. Um, I graduated in 2019. So, um, but yeah, I use it for recruiters to find me for companies to look over my stuff, you know, cause I do have my LinkedIn on my resume. I have like the link to it. So if they wanted to check that out, um, then they can. It's pretty much all the same stuff that's on my resume, but like mm -hmm. more. Cause like, obviously, like you were saying, you should cater your resume to each position. So, but on my LinkedIn, I have like other miscellaneous roles that I've held. Gotcha. Um, I would say there's a lot of APO alumni in the country. So I don't think it'd ever be like a bad thing to have that as your cover photo. Cause there's always, there, there's going to be probably a random person. It's like, Hey, wait a minute. I was, I had that in college. I thought I had in my class the other day. Um, I mentioned I was in a service fraternity and this and happened. And he goes, wait a minute, you were in a service fraternity? Was it APO? I'm like, yeah. So those people will randomly kill up. So that might make your profile stand out a little bit more. Um, okay. Because somebody might see and go, oh, I was a brother and I know brothers of Alpha Omega are really cool. All right. Yeah, I think step four. Uh, accomplishment statements, part two. That should also be on your LinkedIn. So uh, these are examples I have on my page. Um, as you can see, you know, promote literacy. I'm down here. Promote literacy through kindergarten reading program and the inclusion of books in weekly lesson. Um, you know, I've got the context. You know, this kindergarten reading program. I, this is something I did. I include books in the weekly lesson plan and the outcome was promoting literacy in the children. So an nice little accomplishment statement should also be on your LinkedIn page, copy and paste it straight from your resume. That works. Why make more work for yourself? Actually, I think I was so worried about going over time that I went fast. So we have um, time for any other questions if you guys have them. So we can, ah, okay, I keep forgetting I can't do that. So this is what we went over today. Um, take the time to evaluate what you wanna start with, what things you wanna try, um, then make a strong resume so that you can get a job and you can you know, keep yourself alive. Um, and then use your LinkedIn page to network, find new opportunities, find new connections hopefully find a really fulfilling career and or graduate program or whatever your post-graduation lives lead you to. Any, any last questions or thoughts or, oh, Victoria, this is something that I was interested in and we didn't talk about it at all. Anything like that? I don't have any questions, but thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> when I did, I did a very, I did just the LinkedIn section um, as a presentation before. And I just had, I think I had two people and it was, questions were a little awkward. It was like, oh, there's two of us <laughs> trying to have this conversation. So I'm glad we've got five people in here. So where are you all? So I'm, I'm in Cincinnati area. I see someone's Toledo. <laughs> I see a I'm, section. I'm from uh, OSU. Okay. I go to Indiana State. I went to Wittenberg University, class of 2019. I went to Rose Holman, which is in Terre Haute. Well, I guess.
And we can um, get off early. You guys can go prep for the next session. I think I'm going to go to the uh, DEI one. So I'm pretty excited for that. I haven't seen anything like that offered before. What is DEI? A diversity and inc inclusion uh, initiative. Oh, gotcha. Thank you very much. Hope yeah. you have a good rest of your Sunday. You guys too. Yes, thank you. Great. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. Bye.